on this edition of Lexington Now, part one of our 2021 year in review. Welcome to Lexington Now and the first of our two-part series reviewing 2021. In a year that was marked heavily by the continuing pandemic, there were also other big news stories. We begin with the swearing in of the new council, which took place in January. Let me share with you a message to the incoming council members from Mayor Gorton, who regrets that she is unable to be with us today. She writes, congratulations two exclamation points. This is a moment of excitement, anticipation, and challenge as you work to serve your districts through this most historic time, a global pandemic. Along with our citizens, I value your dedication to the greater good and anticipate these next two years as we move forward together. Welcome aboard. Two more exclamation points. So thank you, Mayor Gorton. So every two years uh, since I became vice mayor, I've had the privilege and honor of making a few remarks at these special occasions. Looking back, I realized that my remarks every time have differed in content, but really have consisted of two parts. One part is celebration, one part is challenge. Though COVID-19 changes many things, it does not change that we have much to celebrate and that we have challenges facing us. So from the broadest perspective, we celebrate our wonderful system of democracy, whose power and promise are reinforced by traditions in, by, reinforced by transitions in leadership, such as the one we are witnessing today. From a more local perspective, we celebrate our great good fortune to live in one of America's great cities. Blessed with outstanding human and natural resources since its founding at McConnell Springs in 1775. Blessed also with a long history of wise decisions about the best use of those resources in building a strong and sustainable community. I gave some thought to listing a few of those wise decisions, but then I worried that um, we might not agree on which ones were wise and which ones were not so wise. Uh, the ability to disagree, one important feature of our democracy we sometimes forget to celebrate. But to leave history aside and come to the present, we are gathered today to celebrate the swearing in of these 12 council members, to congratulate them and to honor them and celebrate all the hard work that goes into an election campaign. We also celebrate that each of them, each of you, is ready, willing, and able to take on the challenges that we face. I will ask the members of the council to stand. As I call your name, you will be officially sworn into office. Administering the oath is the Honorable Melissa Moore Murphy, Fayette District Court Judge. Representing the first district, James Brown. Representing the second district, Josh McKern. Representing the third district, Hannah Legree. Representing the fourth district, Susan Lamb. Representing the fifth district, Liz Sheehan. Representing the sixth district, David Klober. Representing the seventh district, Preston Worley. Representing the eighth district, Fred Brown, representing the 9th District, Whitney Elliott Baxter, representing the 10th District, Amanda Mays Bledsoe, representing the 11th District, Jennifer Reynolds, representing the 12th District, Kathy Plowman. you would please raise your right hand. 
I do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of this Commonwealth and be faithful and true to the Commonwealth of Kentucky so long as I continue a citizen thereof, and that I, will, that I will faithfully execute to the best of my ability the office of Member of Council of the Lexington Fayette Urban County Government according to law. And I do further solemnly swear that since the adoption of the present Constitution, I, being a citizen of this state, have not fought a duel with its deadly weapons within this state, nor out of it, nor have I sent or accepted a challenge to fight a duel with deadly weapons, nor have I acted as a second in carrying a challenge, nor aided or assisted any person thus offending, so help me God. If you do so swear, please say, I do. Congratulations. Also in January, Lexington welcomed new fire chief, Jason Wells. So my name is Jason Wells. As of January 4th, 2021, I was sworn in by Mayor Gordon as Lexington's 19th fire chief. Um, very surreal and, and exciting moment for me. I'm the son of a firefighter. My dad came on the job in 1982 on the Lexington Fire Department, um, served for 27 years prior to his retirement. Um, I well, initially graduated from high school in, in 1992 and went to UK. And uh, I was there and it sort of hit a point in my life where I became a little bit um, frustrated with, with where I was. I really didn't find the meaning that I was hoping to find uh, initially there at school and as I was talking to my dad about it and he said well you know the fire department's always an option for you so the next hiring process I signed up and I was extremely fortunate uh, I got hired at 21 years old very very young to come on the job but I did and I came on the job in 1996 um, was assigned at station 7 on Tate's Creek Road station 16 which you may recognize as the underground station for, for several years I uh, was promoted to lieutenant and uh, worked a couple of different assignments and then landed at Station 4 on Jefferson Street. Kind of an old school neighborhood firehouse. You're right plopped in the middle of that neighborhood. So we really got to know the people. I enjoyed it so much that I ended up spending about 13 years there uh, until I promoted out of that station. It always was important to me to do something that had meaning. So it had to be something that was a, a meaningful career where I felt like I was making a difference in somebody's life. And throughout the years, I witnessed that. I witnessed um, my father coming home and, and maybe talking about a call that they had made. But I also witnessed the camaraderie uh, that lives within the fire service. So uh, the people that he worked with were more like family than they were like colleagues. Um, he's, he's been a huge influence and it's not uh, necessarily the things he would say. It's just witnessing the way that he acted and uh, his interactions with other people. He, he's uh, a very quiet, uh, stable leader and, and people uh, naturally wanted to follow him because of their loyalty, not because of his demeanor and not because he demanded it, but because people respected him. And, and that's been probably the single biggest influence on my leadership style as well. In the interim of uh, all of my assignments, I had gone back to school, uh, finished my bachelor's degree, and earned an MBA. And when I got upstairs and started getting involved in some of the human resources functions and some of the budgeting and things like that, I found that it allowed me to leverage uh, my education and continue to serve in a little bit different way. So, so that was a, a lot of fun. I can remember distinctly uh, 25 years ago having discussions with my fellow classmates in our recruit academy that gosh if I can make captain that is going to be the pinnacle you get to ride a fire truck and and that's the highest rank where you still ride an engine or a ladder and that's what I want to do and I want to be at that level and I had almost 20 years on uh, when I finally made major and promoted out of the, the fire station and and even at that point had really no ambition of of coming to administration, but as I became more and more involved in the administration of the fire department, I realized more and more that there is an opportunity to make a difference. I have lived in Lexington for the vast majority of my adult life. I grew up in Winchester and moved to Lexington in 1992 to go to UK, been here for, for the most part ever since. I've been married for almost 20 years. I have one daughter, she's eight years old. She is a, a whole lot of fun and, and a whole lot of attitude. You know, at, at that age, they're, they're a tremendous amount of fun and she's sort of figuring out who she is. Knowing the time uh, that has to go into it and, and the, 
the demands of a position like this, my family had to be completely on board. And uh, thankfully they were, and um, they supported me 100% in this journey, and I'm very thankful for that. First of all, you have to recognize, and now would be foolish to not recognize, that we have a lot of challenges. We are in the middle of a worldwide pandemic, uh, and that's not going away tomorrow. It's gonna take a lot of time for vaccines to sort of process in, and, and we don't know what that's gonna look like. We don't know what the time frame is. Um, there are economic repercussions from the virus that, that we're gonna be feeling for a while. Socially, there is a lot going on in the world. We are in the midst of, of some significant social change. With that said, I'm extremely excited. I think the opportunities that are out there for us uh, to partner uh, with our, our other agencies within the government, with entities outside the government, to deliver service to the community are, are limitless. And, and we're limited only by our creativity in a lot of instances. One of my focuses is our service delivery. And, and when you think about fire service, service delivery, um, the thing that comes to mind is the tones going off and we make an emergency response. We help someone at the worst moment potentially in their life. And that's very, very important. But service delivery comes in a lot of different forms. And one of the things that we've discovered over the last several years is programs like our smoke alarm installation program, like our car seat installation program, like our community paramedicine program, those programs are meeting people out in the community where they are instead of relying on them to have an emergency first and then call us to come fix it. Um, and so those are, are some kind of innovative ways that we're getting out there and delivering service that are a little bit non-traditional. I'll talk a little bit about what my three priorities maybe are for, for the department. So obviously service delivery, uh, I wanna continue to be innovative. Um, we have some amazingly smart people. Operational efficiency, be it emergency response or non-traditional ways of delivering service. I'm, I'm excited about that and that's certainly a priority of mine. Um, also diversity and inclusion within the department. Um, I'm looking for, actively looking for, ways of increasing our ability to get the message out to the community at large that regardless of who you are, the fire service is a career option for you. And we want to make sure that we're touching everybody in the community to make sure that they're aware that this is an opportunity. The other side of that equation is the inclusiveness. Diversity without inclusion isn't that great, but when you have the whole picture and people know that they're valued, they know that their opinion matters, and regardless of who you are, if you come on this job, you're respected and you know that we appreciate you, that's kind of the full picture. Of, of the diversity and inclusion with this, within this organization. I'm excited about what we can do. And then the final component of my three priorities is overall firefighter wellness. Um, we've done some amazing work. Chief Chilton, uh, in her tenure, made some tremendous progress in mental health of firefighters, really starting to recognize that taking care of firefighters allows them to deliver the service that the community needs. And it's an area that was underappreciated and understudied for a long, long time. I wanna make sure we don't drop the ball on the initiatives that she started. We're gonna take it, we're gonna run with it, and hopefully maybe even expand uh, some of those things. So it's more of a holistic view of firefighter wellness, um, not just taking care of your aches and pains and, and bumps and bruises, uh, but also taking care of your mental health as well. So. Uh, those are the three priorities that I think are really important to keep us moving forward and, and we're going to continue to try to do everything we can to best serve this community. When we come back, the Lafayette Hotel's 100th anniversary. Welcome back to Lexington Now. 
We continue our year in review with the celebration of 100 years of the Lafayette Hotel, now housing the Government Center. When the Lafayette Hotel formally opened on Thursday, December the 2nd, 1920, it was the second largest hotel in Lexington, overtopped only by the nearby Phoenix Hotel. While second in size, the Lafayette had the finest, most contemporary design and was the only fireproof hotel in Lexington for the period. The grandiose hotel was to employ about 50 people. One of those 50 was Leonard L. B. Schaus, the president of the Lafayette Hotel Company. Quoted from the Lexington Herald Special Edition article, November 28, 1920, Schaus remarked, I have long dreamed that Lexington would someday have such a wonderful, up-to-date hotel as this. Schaus went on to proclaim that the hotel was one of the best-equipped hostilities, not only in the South, but the entire country as well. A labor of love. The hotel was Schaus's pride and joy. While we may view the building through the lens of our modern perspective, at the time of its debut, the Lafayette was the height of extravagance. No expense was spared to make this hotel the most elegant and modern place anywhere around. The $2 million hotel included the finest furniture, lighting, decor, floors, plumbing, and other amenities found in no other hotels at the time. Boasting 300 rooms, the November 28, 1920 Lexington Herald article detailed each with his own private bath and all the comforts of modern hotel plumbing. Even the cement, which was supplied by Speed Portland Cement and other building materials used, were the most advanced for the era. In one advertisement, the contractor Mason and Hunger Contracting Company stated the Lafayette Hotel stands as firm as the Rock of Ages. Another such declaration stated, bricks meant for mortar, stronger than the brick itself used. The Lexington Herald published a special section in the November 28, 1920 edition to commemorate the Lafayette Hotel's formal grand opening. Companies that had any affiliation with the Lafayette building proudly placed their quarter size advertisements in the edition. The newspaper also had a schedule of events for opening day on December 2nd, 1920. The grand opening was from 10 a.m. until 5 p.m. Special provisions were made for the men from 10 a.m. until noon and for the ladies from 3 to 5 p.m. One can only imagine how proud L.B. Schaus was on that day. And what is a grand opening without an elaborate evening dinner dance to complete the day? The event was scheduled for 7 p.m. and was priced at $5 per plate. Held in the ballroom, which was claimed to be the finest in the South, the newspaper mentioned a program of music, flowers, and entertainment in keeping with this notable event will be presented throughout the dinner and dance, truly partying like it's 1920. As Lexington and the world changed, the Lafayette Hotel stood firm as the Rock of Ages for 43 years. Throughout those years, it saw many guests and diners pass through its doors. Keeneland visitors found respite in its stately rooms. Meeting and functions were held in the elegant ballroom. However, in 1963, the hotel closed its door to guests. But in the coming years, the building would serve an important new purpose. In 1982, it was purchased by the LFUCG. With some renovations in 1984, the building became the headquarters of our local city government. Today, the building is undergoing some renovation and repairs. However, one can still see the elegant and beautiful decor of her Lafayette hotel days. Happy 100th anniversary to this grand old building. In 1890, the most significant election reform since 1890 was signed into law. We were there for the announcement. Today is a red letter day for elections in Kentucky. At 10 a.m. this morning, Governor Bashir signed into law House Bill 574, the most significant election reform law in our state since 1891. Literally, the horse and buggy era is the last time that we revisited our election system. That bill makes seven significant changes. Uh, it expands the days to go vote from one day to four. Four convenient days to vote, including a Saturday for the first time in Kentucky history, something that's great for working people. Uh, it provides for vote centers so that voters can vote conveniently at a central location regardless of where they live in their county. It keeps the absentee ballot request portal that works so well in 2020. 
It keeps the cure process that helps us ensure that voters aren't disenfranchised because their signature looks different today than it did 20 or 30 years ago when they registered to vote. Uh, it also allows for us to take further steps to clean up our voter rolls. It's very important to have clean and accurate voter rolls. Uh, it bans ballot harvesting. Uh, we actually saw an election in North Carolina for U.S. Congress overturned just two years ago due to ballot harvesting. They couldn't tell who actually won that election fair and square. Uh, and lastly, that bill provides for Kentucky to move uh, universally to paper ballots, paper ballots that we count electronically, all the speed of a quick count with the security of a paper trail. And so that was all just at 10 a.m. this morning. Uh, now it's 11.30 and we have even more uh, to offer today. I'm very pleased to announce uh, that through a grant arranged uh, through a joint partnership of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, the Kentucky Office of Homeland Security, the Office of the Secretary of State, and the Lexington Fayette County Urban Government. We are now providing for uh, devices to be allocated at no cost to our county clerks, providing for two-factor authentication for all logins to the statewide voter registration system. One of the issues I discussed when I was a candidate for this office was my sense that we need to enhance cybersecurity. Now, obviously, we've done a lot in the last 15 months to make it easier to vote and harder to cheat, but cybersecurity is an issue you can never take your eye off the ball on. Uh, my predecessor uh, labored on that issue, and I have as well. About a year ago, we were approached by the Kentucky Office of Homeland Security, a part of the Bashir administration. They had access to federal grant monies that could be used to improve our election process, and they sought uh, input from our office about how exactly to do that, uh, especially with Assistant Secretary Jennifer Scutchfield uh, leading the effort. Uh, we've worked with the federal government, with the state government, uh, and with the local government here to provide uh, for this to actually become a reality. Uh, here's what it is in English. There are approximately 800 people around the state that have a login access to our voter registration system. Again, at, at no charge, we're going to be providing devices that provide for two-factor authentication. The same sort of security that we see in the private sector, we are now finally bringing to our election process. Uh, the local government here in Lexington was our first choice uh, to actually administer this grant. Uh, the restrictions of this grant uh, at the federal level are that they have to be uh, allocated to and utilized by a local government. This is for a local improvement, not for a statewide body such as my office. Uh, so we worked in partnership with Mayor Gordon for the past year to work this out. Uh, Mayor Gordon and her government were our first choice for the right county to have the professionalism and competence to implement this program. And so although this is a statewide program that will benefit all 120 counties, and their clerks and their logins. It's going to be orchestrated by Mayor Gordon and her team. Uh, 2020, of course, was a demanding year for everyone. We had a pandemic that turned the world on its head at times, but we also had local, state, and national elections, and holding elections during a pandemic forced us to think differently about how we voted. I'm very proud of Kentucky and especially proud of Lexington as we had safe, secure elections. We worked closely with Fayette County Clerk Don Blevins Jr. to provide ballot drop-off locations, a secure vote counting location, an online feed of activity which our citizens could access, and extensive communications to let everyone know about the changes. Voting was accessible and convenient more than ever before, and it was very successful. We can always continue to think critically and creatively, and this is a great example of that. And I'm happy to join Secretary Adams along with several state offices and agencies to enhance our election system safety. In July came the announcement that Lexington would receive a sizable amount of the American Rescue Plan Act money, or ARPA. Lexington expects to receive $120 million over two years from the American Rescue Plan Act funding. It is money to help us heal from COVID-19. It is money 
that can have a significant and lasting impact on our city. It is money that can help our city soar into a brighter future. As leaders, we all know how important it is for us to make wise choices. And today, I'm here to report that our decision-making process is off to a strong start. The council and the administration have worked together for several weeks to craft a transparent process that starts with extensive public input through an online survey, public meetings, and appearances at neighborhood gatherings through all the districts. I am planning town halls in July and August. This is a transparent process, a public process, a process that invites everyone to participate. So starting at two o'clock today, the process begins. The online survey goes live, and we begin several weeks of activities designed to gather public opinion on use of these monies. Council has been interested in a public engagement process that would produce the full range of possible projects for our consideration so that we can compare and evaluate the ideas against one another on their merits. We expect, this is an understatement, we expect many worthwhile projects to be proposed and we know our task will be challenging. So the top priority are projects that would have a direct impact on vulnerable populations and projects that would help people most severely affected by the pandemic. Next, projects that are budget related, those that produce savings or increased revenue and are one-time projects that have no ongoing costs. So here, we are looking to the long-term fiscal health of our community and being careful with these projects not to increase pressures on our ongoing budget. Listed as additional principles are projects that lead to economic opportunity and projects that have a positive impact on our social and physical infrastructure. So in sum, we have put together a process that we believe gives everybody an opportunity to participate. Now, we're calling on the community to bring us your ideas. We will have paper copies available throughout the community at community centers, at the library, at many, many different locations so that people can pick them up. We'll have uh, some places where people can get help filling them out. Uh, when people go on the website and they'll go to lexingtonky.gov, this, um, the timeline will be on there. And we do have, I believe, the time for public input ends August 27th for the survey. Any proposal will be voted up or down and it takes a majority of council, eight votes, to approve any project. We have no idea what kind of ideas we'll get. We could have things that at first blush seem like, whoa, wait a minute, and then we vet through them and think about them and they could be the most awesome, most impactful project we could ever do. That's what we're hoping, is for long-term impact. It has the potential to be transformative. And what's exciting from my perspective, I'll speak for myself, is exactly what the mayor said also. And that is to see what this community can come up with that will really inspire and make a difference in the long run and just, be, uh, just make a huge difference for our community. Be sure to tune in next week as we bring you part two of our annual year in review and some of the major news stories that shaped Lexington. That's all for now, but as always, you can keep up with us on social media. Check out the latest traffic updates on Twitter at LexRex or catch our live traffic cams at LexingtonKY.gov. For all of us at LexTV, I'm Neil Noah, and that's it for now.